Well, welcome to week two. We made it to Fresh Prince. Week two. Thank you for enduring week one again. Um, who, who found it a helpful refresher? For those that have no idea what I'm talking about, we started this series in uh, March called Fresh Prince. I think it was March. And then the week after COVID came in and uh, we couldn't finish it. I didn't want to do it online. I like to do it in the room. And so we uh, started again last week and uh, preached the exact same message because you probably forgot the first one because there's been a lot on this year. And I, I forgive you. I forgive you. Um, but tonight... We're going to, I'm going to give you a quick recap on what last week was, right? And it's based off of um, our key scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has gone. The new is here. And we talked about this life that we try and build, that we, we, we build this life the best way we can with the things in our life available to us. And we get to this point where we need to engage the help of the author of life, the master builder. If, we, if we're honest with ourselves, it looks okay at the bottom, but we get to this point where we just say, God, I, this is a mess and I need your help. I don't want to do things the way that I've done them. I don't want to make this up as I go anymore. The, 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 uh, the ways of the world have not helped me and I need help from the author of life. John says that um, Jesus is the author of life. And so I don't know about you, but I'm going to listen to him when it comes to the things of life, right? And so there comes this point where we build this thing and we look at it and we say, God, I, 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 I'm proud of what I built to a degree, but I've gone as far as I can go. And it's not worth me keeping. And God, instead of me just adding Jesus, instead of me inviting you into my life and just adding you as a little block, a little addition, a little renovation to what I'm building, God, I, I choose to now f- choose to uh, lay, your, um, have you as a foundation in my life. You are not a renovation anymore. You've come to demolish my life. Your, when you come to Christ, it is a demolition of your life, not a renovation of your life, right? He's not an add-on that just makes your life a little bit better. That's not what Jesus is, right? You can try and live that way, and you might have moments where you feel good, and it might be a nice add-on, right? But all in all, the whole building for it to change, if you want to be the new creation, this is the key word here, right? The new building, the new creation, we need to start afresh, right? And God offers us the ability to start afresh. And he says we do it upon his word. He is the cornerstone, the foundation of our faith, and we live our life with fresh prints, fresh blueprints and fresh fingerprints. They're the two things that God wants to come and change in your life. He wants to build your life by telling you who you now are, your fresh fingerprints, and how you should now live, right? Your fresh blueprints. That's how God wants to transform your life. Um, thank you, Sam. I appreciate what you've built. But now, now, Sam, if you could just come to Jesus for a minute and lay it down before the Lord. I know you just built it, but... Thank you, mate. Thank you. That is a picture of what it's like to come to Christ. It's like, see you later. Whatever I've built, it's gone. It's not worth it for what the joy that I could have in Christ. And so this feels like a bit of a vulnerable space, right? When you give your life to God, things are all over the place. You're like, what do I pick up and build with again? What have I left behind? What can I start again with? And so this series is about saying, what can I add to my new life? What does God want to build my new life with? Are any of these blocks suitable to fit on there. And for that general day-to-day, we use the Word of God. We say, is this aligned with Scripture? Is this something I should be doing with my life? But I think there's a few overarching themes in our culture today that are contentious, that are up for challenge with, with God. And I think that God is looking for our first thing to be put on this in the correct way is our identity. The first thing that changes, the first thing that you give something new is what? You give it a new name, right? Identity is incredibly important. And so today we are talking about the first thing that goes on here, and that is your new identity. Are you ready? I love you all. So does Jesus. I'm going to pray. 
Father, thank you for this opportunity to come around and, and speak the truth tonight and to hear what you have to say to us. We pray that you would um, speak to every individual, to our hearts today. Convict us where we need conviction. We come to you open-hearted, soft soil, ready to receive what you would have us receive today. Amen. Identity. You know, I noticed the other day that my Insta bio is empty. Has anyone got an empty in Insta bio? Everyone's like, no, mine's full. And I thought, what would I put in my Insta bio? You know, you, you go through like, diff people are like freaking out, like you have nothing in your Insta bio. I can see it, no, it's going straight over everyone's heads. Like, how is that possible? I've often thought about what to put in it. You know, when you go into someone's Instagram and you can see like the little summary of who they are, it's what they've written down there. Maybe mine would look like, you know, husband, father, Jesus lover, friend, pastor, Manchester United supporter, 30. <laughs> I'll take that. All-round good guy, you know. You know, you look around and you see what other people put in their bios and it'll be like Proverbs 31, girl, entrepreneur, teacher. And, you know, one thing I've noticed by looking at people's Instagram bios and, and just in general in life is that we tend to identify ourselves by what we do, or by the way we live, by our thoughts, by our actions, by our beliefs, right? In the past, if you had asked me who I am, if, if you came up and said who I am, I, apart from saying I'm Ben, the way we describe ourselves, the way we identify ourselves is often done by what we do. I might have said, um, yeah, I'm Ben, I'm a musician, I'm a, I'm a volunteer at my church, I'm a, I'm a life group leader, uh, I'm a sport lover, a bit of an all-rounder when it comes to handy things, you know, a Christian bit of a straight shooter when it comes to a conversation, you know. There was one time I even had an Xbox name um, called Ibis Hunter because of an unfortunate experience I had with an Ibis, right? And I don't say that this isn't confession time, right? The Lord has dealt with me. It's a long time ago, right? But even my Xbox identity was based off of something that happened in my life, an action, right? And um, we, we have a tendency to identify ourselves by what we've done in our past, the lives we live right now, maybe what you even feel or what you believe. That's how we, that's our framework for identifying ourselves. Do you see that? Right? That's what we tend to do in this world. If you're an architect, you might say, oh, hi, I'm Ben and I'm an architect. Right? If you're a musician, you might say, oh, I'm a, I'm a musician. If you're shy, you might say, oh, I'm an introvert. Right? If you misbehave in school, you might identify as a naughty boy or a naughty girl. If you don't eat animal products, you might identify as a vegan, right? If you don't feel great about things like abortion, you might identify as something like pro-life, right? If you are same-sex attracted, you might identify as part of a certain community, no matter what your situation, this world and the way that we are taught to identify ourselves is based on what we do, what we feel, what we believe, or by how we live. Can you see that tonight? Just simple facts that I'm putting out here tonight. We do our best to find meaning, purpose, identity in this life through these labels and through these causes. This is the life that's been given to us. This is how we live. But this, whilst it may be all we know, is not how God operates when it comes to identity. This is not how God operates when it comes to identity. See, the world says that our life shapes our identity. But God says our identity shapes our life. And there's a fundamental difference in those two things. Have you ever noticed that there's times in the Bible where God changes people's names? There's a number of times where God goes up to someone and changes 
their names. And I think that's a bold move. Like, I, what if I like my name, you know? But he's God, you've got to go with it, right? He did it four times. And when he did, it was never actually based on their past or what they did for a job or how they lived their life. Every time God changed someone's name in the Bible, it was because of the future that he had for them. Every time. It was about the things that he had planned for them to do. It was about the new identity that he had always planned for them to have. He didn't identify them based on what they currently were or what they were in the past. It was all about who they were meant to be. Right? Let's have a, let's have a little look. Abram and Sarai are the first two of the four. We read in Genesis 17, 1 to 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell down, uh, face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll be father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. The kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. That's a big promise after a name change. The name change was to do with his future. In that moment, he changed his identity because he wanted to say something about his future, not about his past, right? Go a little bit further, you see Sarah's name changed in, 17, uh, in verse 15 to 16. God also said to Abraham, as for you, Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. Here comes the promise. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. God changed their name and their identity, not based on who they were, but who were they, they were called to be, right? He didn't do it based on where they'd come from, the religion that they were a part of, their job, their occupation. He changed it based on the future and the life that he wanted to build for them. He changed their identity first. The, the third person is Jacob, known as the man who wrestled with God, right? What a, what a reputation, putting God in like a headlock all night and then him giving up. Different story. Let's have a quick look. Genesis 32, 22 to 28. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons. Oh, 11 kids. And crossed the ford to Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. God gave Jacob a new name. It canceled out his old identity, which was one that he was not proud of. It was one that was holding on to his older brother's promises, the promises of someone else that promised no returns for him. He changed his name to Israel, which all of God's people was named after, the nation of Israel, right? The name change was to do with who God was calling him to be, not what he had been. He changed his identity first. His life followed suit. The, the fourth person is Simon, who we know as Peter, right? Humble fisherman following Jesus, and he's the first person to, to believe and, and say with his mouth that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is the moment we read when he says that to Jesus. In Matthew 16, 13 to 19, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are now Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. See, the way that the world would have defined Peter was as a fisherman. Simon the fisherman. But Jesus defined Peter by the call that he had for his life, for who he was going to be. Do you think Peter had any clue what his future is? We know the end of the story. We know how this makes sense. In that moment, I'm like, oh, great, thanks for calling me rock. That actually translates as pebble. It's not even big rock. It's like, it means little rock, right? Because God's the big rock. He says, Peter, you'll be the pebble, the little rock. <laughs> it reminds me of that. Is it in Hot Rod? He's like, here's a, here's a pet rock. It's a token of all my hard work. <laughs> it's like, wow, cool name, God. Fast forward to the book of Acts, and you see Peter giving that first sermon, the birth of the church, after they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And thousands of people are saved and the ministry and the expansion of the church begins with Peter. God changed his name and his identity because of who he could become and who he wanted him to become, not who he had been. Are you seeing the trend here? This is how God works with identity. But can I tell you, it's stark contrast to how the world works with identity. That is why I'm bringing it up tonight because some of the things we think about identity just do not fit when we're trying to build our life on them because it's not actually how God works in the area of identity. Why is God so concerned with identity? Because how you identify changes the way you live. Does anybody remember what it was like to go to like a friend's house for the first time? Like a new friend's house. It could be a bit, a little bit awkward. You don't really know the parents very well. You have no idea what they're customs are like in that house, it might have shoes off, shoes on, you know, from the front door, you don't knock, you know, you go to the front door and you ring the doorbell, you're that nervous, right, you know, you're so polite, you know, you ask, hey, where's the bathroom, you don't say toilet, you know, we say, hey, where's the bathroom, has it, ever, anyone struggled with that use of words before, it's like, hey, I don't want to say, where's the toilet, oh, hey, have you seen the bathroom, where's the bathroom, right, you know, you sit and you wait until you're offered something before you eat anything. You know, you could be sitting there starving, but you're just like, no, nah, I'm not going to make a deal. You start every sentence with, um, excuse me, to their parents. You know what I mean? It's like, hi, uh, excuse me. Why do we act like this? Because identity is important. And in that house, you're not one of the children. You don't belong in that house. You're a stranger as far as anyone's concerned in that house. But when you get back to your house, your behavior changes, doesn't it? Forget the front door, I'm going in the back door, right? Forget asking for the food, I'm going straight to the fridge. Forget knocking on the toilet door, I'm just going straight in. Do you know what I mean? Your identity, change, identity changes there because you're in your father's house. You're the child of the house, right? And it changes how you live in that environment, right? That's a silly illustration, but it's showing you that identity will change how you act, right? If you are a young boy in primary school, maybe, you have high energy, maybe high intelligence. You're bored out of your mind in school, right? Maybe grade one. I'm thinking of a certain child of mine, right, who's maybe, maybe heading this direction himself. I've had conversations with his teachers already, right? And you're know, just disengaged from what's going on. You just want to have fun, you know, and you're becoming a bit of a distraction to yourself, a bit of a distraction to other people. And all of a sudden, you start to get this label, this identity as the naughty kid. And I started to see Leon getting it. I was like, oh, no, did I give him this? <laughs> Is this my fault? <laughs> and over the years, whilst they may not have started as a naughty kid, Leon's a beautiful kid, right? But if you keep on telling someone that they're a naughty kid, guess what he's going to live up to? It starts to become his identity. He becomes the naughty kid, right? 
And then from that point on, he only knows how to be that version of himself. Right? Identity changes the way you live. It changes the way you think about yourself. And it will affect your life. Yeah? Can you see that tonight? The cycle goes on and our actions and our attitudes follow our identity. And God knows that if the first thing in your life, in the new creation, the new thing he's building, he knows if the first thing to change is your identity and how you call yourself, how you see yourself, the rest will follow. That's why he's changing people's names. He's like, I'm going to speak this over you. I'm going to make it so that you're no longer seeing yourself as a failure in the shadow of your brother, Jacob. I'm going to call a nation after you. I'm going to call a nation after you, right? And it changes the way you see yourself. That's why identity is such a big deal to God. Here's the problem. We can only have one identity. There is only one you. There is only one you. There is only space for one identity in myself and you. And what happens so often is when we come to God, we go to receive the new things that God has spoken over us. Maybe our new name, maybe our new fresh prints, our fingerprints, right? We come to receive that new identity. But for some reason, we struggle to let go of our old ones. the things that we used to identify as, the things that used to bring us purpose, the things that used to bring us belonging, the things that used to bring us significance. We struggle to let them go and trust God that he's going to give us all of those things his own way, right? Maybe it's because of our pride we struggle to let go of them. Maybe it's because of our ego. Maybe it's because of our insecurities. Maybe we just have no idea what we're doing. And our inability or unwillingness to let go of who we were hinders the possibility of us becoming who we were always meant to be. See, in James 1, 6 to 8, it says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Let me just repeat that. A double-minded person is unstable in all they do and should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Yikes. Al, can you get these up here? I was going to do them down there, but I I don't think people on the stream will be able to see it. (laughs) I'm just over here. Here is what I think this looks like in the context of our lives that we're trying to build when we come to Christ. When we come to God, we come with all of our baggage. We come two feet in our old lives, right? I'm very tall up here. I'm all of a sudden realizing. Um, I'm not afraid of heights. It's okay. Um, And we have all of these things that we hold on to for our purpose, our belonging, our identity, our significance, and we get given this opportunity to grab a new life, to be born again, to receive a new name in Christ, a new identity as a person, right? And we take a step towards it, and yet we don't let go of our old life. And in this spot is incredible vulnerability in more ways than one right? This is a picture of a double-minded person. And can I tell you, you'll be unstable in all your ways. This is not a position to build your life. Can I tell you, in fact, this in your old life is a better position to build your life. You will build something much better here than you will here. Just go back to living the way you wanted to. Grab the identities that the world gives you. Live them out. Talk them out. Speak them out. And just go for it. You'll build something, but will it be what God wanted for your life? It's not his plan. It's not his version of identity, right? And so we get to this place where we're in between. Maybe we haven't let go of 
what we used to hold on to as the things that brought us value, significance, identity. But we need to get to a place where we put two feet in and we stand on the foundation that is Jesus and say, I receive the new identity you have for me. I want to build the life that you have for me. I want to receive the promise you've spoken over me and I'm going for it with all my heart. I don't want to be a double-minded man, unstable in all my ways. If you're going to build something on me, I'm going to need two feet in, right? This is a picture of identity tonight. And we have an identity crisis. Why did we do that? You know, maybe, maybe you wanted all the gain but none of the pain. Maybe you just wanted to continue to be popular in every situation you went to. Because choosing one side or the other tends to make you unpopular with someone. And sometimes when we get caught in the middle, it's often because we didn't want to let go and disappoint anybody. Maybe you just understood your old life way better than your new one and found it way too vulnerable to let go. Maybe these pieces on the floor is everything you knew. And to move to something new, an identity that I don't know, there's this gap in the middle and it's scary. I don't understand it. I don't judge anyone for being in the middle tonight. Do you understand? There's all sorts of reasons we end up here, and they're all valid. But there's a reason to talk about it tonight. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, and I don't want to receive nothing from God. I want to build the life that He's called me to live. I want the fresh prince tonight. You might be saying to yourself, well, you know, the causes that I've given my life to, the, the groups and the things that I've identified with in my life, they're good things. They're, they're noble things. Some of them might even reflect the heart of God, but they've taken the place as your identity. And you say, why do I have to give these things up? Why do I need to cut ties with these attachments to my identity? Because there's only space for one you. There is only one identity that you can have. There is only one you. And your identity now comes in Christ alone. Christ alone. No matter what you feel you could give up by giving your life to Jesus, whether it be your opinions on things, whether it be your political allegiances, whether it be maybe even your sexual preferences, maybe your beliefs about the world, your thoughts about justice, nothing comes close to the joy and the hope of knowing Jesus Christ. Nothing comes close. Let me give you such a good example of this with the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 3, 4 to 9, we'll get that up on the screen. Al, can you just um, get rid of these now? This whole thing is about Paul bragging about his previous identity, just so you know the context to read this in, right? He says, if somebody else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day over the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever gains... To me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For him, uh, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Let me give you um, a little breakdown of what this is actually saying. Paul is saying here, he's having a little brag about how much confidence he could have had in his previous identities. The things that gave him value, status, worth, uh, significance, meaning, right? He talks up his reputation and his earthly identity for a moment. He says... Uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Bit of a weird flex, but nonetheless, that's what he's doing. You've got to understand the context of this passage is a 
a bit of a divide between people groups, right, and accessing the promises of God. Um, he's like, I'm of the people of Israel. More than that, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Good tribe. I'm a true Hebrew of Hebrews. Do you see how he's identifying himself? He's got all these things from his previous life. He's saved and different, by the way. This is a, talking about his previous life. He went, when, I came, when it came to the law, I was great at it. You know, I was so self-righteous. I was so justified by the things of this world, the things that I had to do to feel great in this world. I was the best. When it came to my job as a Christian killer, my zeal was incredible. You know, I was the best Christian killer around. That was his job for those that don't understand. That's what he came from when he, before he met Jesus. And as for my ability to live according to the law, it was falseless. Faultless. faultless. It was faultless. He's saying, I've got all these incredible parts of my life that make me reputable. They make me virtuous even. They give me significance. They make me feel like I have a community of people, right? He's saying, I've got all these things that make me even feel extra moral, extra special, extra proud. They brought me purpose. I was passionate about them. I was highly regarded by the people of this world and the law of the day. I had everything I wanted or needed, yet I didn't know Jesus. And whatever I used to have, I consider it as garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. I consider them garbage, loss, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He's saying essentially if anybody had something to lose here, it was me. More than all of you. If anybody had identity to leave behind, it was me. If you think you have lots to lose, I had more, is what Paul is saying. And I stand here to testify that it was worth losing every bit to know Jesus, to know his plan for my life. That's what Paul is saying here. And sometimes when we come to Christ, we don't want to let go of these old things. Our old mindsets, our old attitudes, our old belief systems, our old opinions, our old habits, our old behaviors. We bring them to God and say, would you just bless that identity? Would you just be the reno? Would you just affirm me for what I feel I am right now? Let me bring my mindsets, bless them anyway. Let me bring my attitudes, bless them anyway. Let me bring the labels that I have on my life that bring me significance, worth, satisfaction, virtue, morality. Let me bring them with me, just bless me with them. I don't want to let them go because I've got too much from them. There's so much to lose. But the reality is, it all needs to be left at the door. It all needs to be left at the door. It all needs to be comp counted as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. You might say, well, well I was born with these labels. I was born this way. You know, we serve a powerful God. And he offers us the opportunity. He uses very specific language when he says, come and be born again in spirit. Come and get a new identity. Come and get a new name. Come and get a new life is what Jesus offers to all. And have your life transformed from the inside out. You are not who you were born as. You are reborn to become who you were always meant to be. Galatians 3. 26 to 29, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have now clothed yourself in Christ. Do you see the identity conversation here? All of you who were baptized into Christ have now clothed yourself in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Firstly, that's a great statement. That's a unifying statement. That is not designed to use our labels to divide us, to be divisive, but to unify mankind unto himself. Amen? And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed according to the promise. I find it so interesting here that all those years ago, Paul's addressing some of the same issues we're dealing with in 2020. Jews and Gentile, he's 
dealing with an issue of race. Male and female, he's dealing with gender issues. Slave and master, he's talking about power, oppression. And God is saying here through Paul, hey, there is no race when it comes to the promises of God. Leave it at the door. There is no sexuality or gender when it comes to the promises of God. Leave it at the door. There is no oppressed nor oppressor at the door. Leave your labels at the door. All are welcome for the life that God has for them. Just leave the labels at the door. I have a new identity for you, and it is what you want to bring in is garbage compared to what I've got for you. Amen? The only label you have now is the one that God has given all of us. He calls us in that passage a child of God, a son and a daughter of the house, a citizen of heaven. Passages like Romans 12 too, which I haven't given you, it says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Why can he say something like that? Because we're not of this world anymore. Our new identity is as of a citizen of heaven, and there's no dual citizenships. We are a citizen of heaven. And when you plant yourself firmly in this position, you place yourself in a position for God to start rebuilding your life the way he wants it. And it starts, it all starts with fresh fingerprints, fresh identity. God cares so much about identity. That's why he does it first. Question. I might get Jolly up. Oh, he's good. Question. How do you identify tonight? JB, do you have my sermon graphic? How, would, how do you answer this question tonight? Is the font big enough? <laughs> Where do you find your purpose? Where do you find your meaning? Where do you find your belonging? Where do you find your truth? Where do you find your virtue? Where do you find your morality? Where do you find your significance? Where do you find your identity? When it comes to your identity, is, is God just saying nice things and you're like, I'll take this, bless my life, bless who I am. We're operating in a way that is not how God deals with identity. God doesn't want to affirm the identity that you have in this world, in this life that you've created somehow. God, God plans so far before your future to give you a brand new identity, a brand new name. And you know, maybe you're in this room tonight. There's a few categories of people here in this message, right? I've moved the boxes now, but you just can imagine them. One here, one here. And you've got two feet in the world. Citizen of earth, earthly labels, identities, things you've had spoken over you, things you've spoken over yourself, things the world has told you that you can categorize yourself into. And you're two feet in the world, living your life, building your life, doing your thing. Maybe you're standing all the way over on the other side and you're two feet in heaven. Feet on the earth, feet on the earth heart full of heaven is what that song says, zeal. And you're just building your life. God's building your life and you're submitting yourself to Him. You've maybe lost a few friends along the way, but the identity, you've picked it up and you're running with it. Maybe you're two feet in heaven. But maybe tonight you're a foot in each. And as you've come to know Jesus, maybe in that moment you struggle to let go of your old life, the old labels, the old identity, the old things that used to give you significance, purpose, meaning, value, to grab the new things that should be giving us meaning, purpose, significance, value. And you're living a life that maybe is not being built into either side that you wanted to build. You might feel unstable in your all your ways. You're you're pulled back and forwards. You're wrestling with this message because you identify with both sides. 
And I'm not talking about empathizing with both sides, by the way. We can empathize with both sides. But we need to identify as one. And you're stuck in the middle and you can't build either line. And there can be a few reasons for that. And I mentioned the first one, maybe you just struggled to let go of your life. But it could also be maybe you were in two feet in. Two feet in, living that life, accepting what God has to say about you, outworking His promises and His plans, His blueprints for your life, on your way. And somewhere over the years, just the fact of being in this earth, around this earth, you've slipped back into picking up old things that gave us worth, things that gave us identity. You might have had a dry spell with God and you're like, you know what, I'm going for some significance in this space. Maybe you've heard some some types of information, been distracted by the different teachings of this world that say you can find purpose, meaning, identity in all these other spaces. You know, Hebrews 13, 8 to 9 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. It's 2020, and I don't need to go into the amount of strange teachings that I've heard just this year alone. But there's a good chance that there are people in this room that were once all in to God. Hearts open, minds open soft soil ready to receive that identity and that life that God has for you. And at some point, the winds of teaching, the things that we hear, the things that we watch, the people that we hang out with, and we we end up grabbing identity from other places again, and we end up in this place where we're not building either life. We're unstable in all our ways. And then we say, God, why? Where is my promise? Where is this life that you promised? Our identity is not found outside of the grace of God. It's found in Him, in Him alone. Philippians 3, 13 to 21. Anyone like Scripture? It's kind of an important one to be talking with Scripture tonight, isn't it? I'd, I'd never want to get up here and just do what I'm feeling to you guys, all right? Philippians 3, 13 to 21. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Following Paul's example, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us, let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as... just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before now, tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Are you hearing the pattern here? Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Our citizenship is in heaven. Letting go of what was, I press forward and onwards to the goal that is found in Christ Jesus. This is who we are, citizens of heaven, heavenward right? We don't live by the patterns and the norms of this world anymore. Neither are we identified by those things because Jesus gave us new identity. We don't go with the flow with what's popular. We submit everything in our lives to Christ and live as children of God and citizens of heaven. Feet on the earth, hearts full of heaven. And there's so much more in this. But does this mean that we can't identify with certain things here on this earth. 
What about my passions for social justice? What about my passions for equality? What about my passions for equity? Does God care about those things? God cares so deeply about justice. Read your Bible. Understand that the heart of God is about justice. The heart of God is about speaking against injustice. God is into justice more than anybody you've ever met or anybody that you have ever known. And what we need to do now is go to God and and pray and say, God, break my heart, not for what is the world's, not for what is mine. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And if it's the same thing, put it back on. But if it doesn't fit, get rid of it. God's motive is not... God's motive is that people would come to know Him. The greatest injustice in this world is that while we sit here and listen to the gospel every single week, there are people that live and die never hearing it. That is an issue of justice. That is the heart of God. People dying, never hearing the gospel. Does God care about this world? Yes. Does God care about injustice? Yes. Does God care about equality and equity and equal opportunity? Yes. But can we look at it through our new identity, please? Can we come to Jesus and say, God, how do you want me to deal with this? Is this hateful? Is this divisive? Were you ever hateful or divisive, Jesus? Did you ever come to divide people or did you come to bring people together? Did you come to love the world? Jesus met with all sorts of people. He met with people that were in issues with their sexuality. The woman who just committed adultery, Go read how he dealt with her, the love, the acceptance, the future he showed her. The Samaritan woman at the well, he dealt with an issue of race. Go read how he responded. We don't have time to go into all these things, but God cares deeply, deeply about the things that divide us. And the answer is not often found in what we're looking for it in. It's found in the fact that we live in a sinful world that needs Jesus that needs a fresh identity. They're looking for hope. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for redemption. And our heart has to come from the same place. Our problem is sin. I just wonder in this moment if we could just bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond tonight. And I think there are people here that would identify in the middle between two spaces. We're, we're drawing our, our purpose, our identity, and our labels from the things of this world, the things that we can do, the things that we can stand up for. And maybe you've realized that maybe you never let go of the things that you came with. Maybe you never left them at the door. Or maybe that you've picked some things back up again. I hope that's a clear understanding of what I'm trying to say our response is tonight. And I don't want to, I'm not going to make anyone raise your hand for this one. Except to challenge you. That next time we sing a song like New Wine that says, make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, with nothing, labels at the door, but all you have given me. Jesus, make new wine out of me. Maybe that song would mean something different to you. But I also want you to understand that when you come to Jesus, he has a future, he has promises, he has a plan for your life. You don't need to feel vulnerable by leaving everything at the door because his promises never fail. His promises never fail. And that if we sang that set list again tonight, you would be able to say, God, make new wine out of me. I leave everything at the door and I take this new creation seriously and I trust that the name you've spoken over me is a signifier of the plans and the future you have for me. Your promises never fail. This is our hope in Christ Jesus, the knowledge of him that surpasses all else.
So I'm going to leave that with you as your own personal challenge. But for others in the room tonight, maybe you've never come to Jesus ever. You've never taken that opportunity to give up your old life and choose a new, to be born again. I want to give you that opportunity tonight. Jesus died on that cross to deal with our human issue, that is sin. And he paid that debt for us on that cross so that we might have access to this new life. And if you would like that tonight, while everybody's got their eyes closed and their heads bowed, just so I can see it, just raise your hand right now, just so I can see that, if you would like to do that for the very first time. I'll just give you a couple more moments. If you would like to receive the new life in Jesus, just raise your hand. If not, that's fine. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we come to you tonight and we we open up our hearts. We lay down our pride, the things that we're so sure of sometimes. And we come to you and we say, God, we know you, you know better. We know you do better. We know you build better. You're the master builder. You're the author of life. And we leave our labels at the door tonight. And we pick up the new name. We are a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. And we give you permission to start changing our lives from the inside out. Transform us from this place of knowledge of who we are and whose we are. In Jesus' name, amen.